Well, uh, welcome everyone to the 27th meeting of the Equalities Human Rights Committee for 2017. Can I remind everyone to turn phones to silent mode? Of apologies from our convener, Christina McKelvey. Moving straight to agenda item one, we have moved back to the draft budget scrutiny for 2018-19 and our first item of business is to continue that process uh, looking at the government's draft budget for next year with a panel of witnesses today and I am very pleased to welcome uh, Judith Robertson, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Safia Ali, Race Equality Mainstreaming Officer from the Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary Sector Organisations Scotland, Chris Oswald who is the Member of Equality and uh, Budget Advisory Group and the Head of Policy of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, and Dr. Angela O'Hagan, who is member of the Equality and Budget Advisory Group and lecturer in the WISE Research Centre. Gosh, what long titles you all have. But you are very welcome. And um, uh, can I remind you, you don't need to press your microphone to speak. The, uh, our audio tech guys will catch you when, it's your, uh, when you wish to speak. I should also at this point declare an interest in that I was previously on the leadership panel of the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights. Um, I'd like to start by asking uh, the panel just a general opening question about the view of yourself and your organisations as to how we currently do as a country in terms of uh, getting equalities and human rights into our budgeting process. Who would like to start? I can start Please, judges. Yeah. Um, so, basically, at the moment, our budget is not, um, I would not be deemed to be delivering in relation to human rights international law, in that it does not take into account in the norms and standards of international um, uh, human rights law in its explicitly in its processes is not analysed with that in mind. Um, it doesn't come from that analysis and understanding in terms of its actual um, either process in terms of its formulation or what it's actually less what it's actually seeking to achieve. Um, so there's 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 aspects where you would in terms of both process and and, and what it's actually doing. Where yes, you would say that that talks to delivery in relation to. Uh, uh, progressive realisation of human rights, but it, currently it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't firmly sit within that context. Right. Who would like to come in next? Yes, Angela. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, to follow on from, from Judith, I mean, it, it, it's about the starting point, really, you know, the extent to which equality and human rights are um, central as a, a, you know, as a starting point for how we allocate public resources and how we raise public revenue. And those frames are not yet dominant. I think we've seen Scotland being in a position of being a pioneer over the years, then it's been a bit of a, a laggard and um, it could pick up again. There is, there is a lot of good work going on behind the scenes, as it were. There's, there's developments in the Equality Evidence Finder and analytical um, developments. Um, there's the inclusive growth drive and the narrative and discourse around that. I think over many years we've seen some very encouraging statements in, included in the, the equality budget statement, for example, um, that have recognised the limitations of the kind of modelling that is used in our fin public finance management. But we need to move beyond that. And I think what we consistently see is a disconnect be between some of that very positive discourse, some of the very positive work going on behind the scenes, and then it being fully implemented in the spending departments. And that's where I think successively we can see we're, we're let down. The equality um, impact assessments and human rights impact assessment processes are not effectively used and the budget while there's very good work going on um, in trying to bring the budget into main you know, thinking about it as a part of the mainstream policy process and that's been increasingly evident over the the kind of iteration of the budget process in Scotland we're not seeing the, the, the portfolio departments keep up with that. And, and we've seen some big omissions in the last year or so, and we can maybe talk about them as well. I think comparatively, looking across Europe, um, we, are, we have led the field in many ways. The nature of our, our political structures in Scotland mean that there, is, there are these types of opportunities to encourage parliamentarians and the policy um, departments in government to, to think about equality and human rights um, and so and th that 
you know, that is an aspect um, for which you know, we're, we're envied internationally, that we have this kind of openness and access and that we can have these conversations. But we need to move from having the conversations to seeing the application and implementation of the analysis that is there and that we have sought to develop the competence in across the piece. Um, there's lots more to say about where we are in terms of, of our um, European neighbours. Um, some countries have taken the, an approach to underpin equality and gender budgeting um, or human rights budgeting um, from a, a, you know, to give it a legal underpinning. Um, we haven't taken that step yet in Scotland, but we have lots of other levers that could be applied to, to reinforce that, as, as Judith has outlined. Thank you, Angela. Chris? Um, yes, I very much agree with both Judith and Angela um, that the progress in Scotland is encouraging, but it's um, whilst, we, whilst we may be ahead of a number of other countries, is that sufficient for Scotland? And I would say at the moment, no. Um, I very much agree with Judith that human rights analysis is largely absent from the budget. There is an equality analysis of it. But I think the issue is whether or not the budget drives policy or policy drives the budget. So as Angela is saying, if the component parts of spend from departments haven't been um, viewed appropriately through the lens of the public sector equality duty or through the Human Rights Act, then what you get as a result is um, a, a bag of unanalyzed things. So things like the equality budget statement become a post hoc analysis rather than equality driving the budget. Um, or driving elements of spend, it tends to be a more reactive statement and saying these are positive things which are happening for women rather than the position of women or ethnic minorities or disabled people driving the budget itself. Um, I'll give one example just now, and I think uh, uh, if you look at the um, affordable housing programme where we're aiming to build 50,000 houses, we have 15,000 wheelchair users in Scotland inappropriately housed. We know that ethnic minorities are four times more likely to be overcrowded. We could resolve those issues potentially through that if we choose to do so, but we don't see that type of driver coming through um, from the department to then feed into the budget. Thank you. And Safi? Well, I agree with everybody that they've said, <laughs> and that's the benefit of coming, uh, you know, saying last, so you can agree with everyone. But um, just what Chris's point um, exactly on the housing. So, <clears throat> I mean, um, ethnic minority communities um, contribute, la uh, you know, a huge um, asset to uh, Scotland, and I think Scotland is the driving force at the moment when it comes to race equality, but we do lag behind when we're looking at um, good quality in good equalities process. Um, I, I've, I've mentioned it, we've mentioned it in our submissions to you in the practice. It's usually, unless it's pre-planned, it's kind of a reactive one at the end of the budget to include, let's, oh, we haven't done anything for ethnic minorities, so we'll include them in, so that means we've done everything, instead of pre-planning it. So that's one of our huge concerns, that even though we're driving forward and we're doing well, there's lots of things that are not pre-planned, and that's our biggest concern, that unless um, black public bodies and um, and unless they have it pre-planned within their budgets and they're actually taking that on, that we are going to be addressing ethnic minority issues and race equality issues specifically, we're just going to then put it as a reactive at the end. And that's our main concern. Thank you. Uh, before I open to my uh, other colleagues on the committee, I'd just like to explore that uh, issue of the disconnect between political rhetoric in this place and in others um, and the actual reality of spend on the ground. I mean, the, the example I always come back to is the uh, 2014 Children and Young People Act, which passed in part one um, some very lofty ambitions around uh, children's rights and making children's rights real, um, and only to have the next year um, the total number of children's rights officers across Scotland's 32 local authorities cut by half and that struck me as a, a perfect example of how you know that rhetoric is not matched by budgeting reality on the ground to what re for what reason do you think that e exists is that about the presumption against mean uh, ring fencing um, or is it about just the fact that we are very good at and talk is cheap um, and yet we've got other priorities and we're living in quite a hostile budgeting environment. Um, what is the reason for that disconnect? Who'd like to go first? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Judith? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, there, I, I suspect there are, I would say there are many reasons for that. that that's a complex picture. Um, from the perspective of this conversation in relation to human rights budgeting, um, I would say that the, well, well, 
two things principally. One is, the, is where the policy is set up front. So the policy work that's done, the thinking that's done, the analysis that's done in terms of both at all levels of government, whether that be national government, Scottish government, um, local authority um, processes, how you would look at that, look at budgeting processes and decision-making process from a human rights perspective would tend to not lead you down that route. If those processes were aligned throughout our systems within Scotland, then we could have a systematic analysis and understanding, um, which is one of the strengths of the human rights framework, is that it actually provides standards, norms, language, and, and a framework for looking at processes which incorporates non-discrimination and equalities um, analysis. Um, which would then help you potentially not lead to that kind of outcome. That's, that's one way of looking at it. We have another issue, which I think which is a, a genuine one, which is around understanding the implications of the legislation that we pass and effectively resourcing the processes which that legislation is intended to deliver. The community empowerment legislation would be potentially a case in point. The SDS, the uh, um, uh, self-directed support legislation would be another example where very good rights-based legislation uh, intended to advance people's rights and progress people's rights but the budget allocation necessary to ensure that that piece of legislation is effectively delivered on the ground is is either out with the gift of the the uk the scottish government who's made the decision or um it, it's within a context where actually effective delivery is being if at the very least threatened by the lack of resources um, or the comprehension of that policy making process through local authorities uh, is not effectively carried out to the end of the day and so there is a dis there is a disconnect um, and it, I would say it's a reasonably big job to tackle that disconnect. Great thanks. Yes Chris. Um, I, again, I would agree. Um, I think I'd pick another example, um, which I know is dear to the committee's heart, which is around gypsy travellers, where the Scottish Government has set aside money in the past for site development. But because of the um, Concordat, the, um, the loosening of ring fencing, those aims can, are not achievable unless you have the um, full consent and buy-in of the local authorities around the table. And we see that across a whole range of different public policy issues. So I don't think it's unique to the budget. It's something which is a consequence of the purposeful relationship between government and local government in that sense. And Angela or Safia, would you like to add to that? I just wanted to add that um, sometimes when you've got ring-fenced um, you know, um, budgets, it's a really positive impact because then you know that that will go mm. to that designated um, that's so if we take for example ethnic minorities when we had race equality positive action in race equality where you knew that in a certain workforce there was th there weren't going to be enough ethnic minorities even coming for these posts so you ring fenced it you made sure that you had positive action in place for employment but the problem we had you know later on was that this was all removed so our dilemma is, is how do we then make sure that I mean one of my other roles is mainstreaming and when I'm sitting there looking at mainstreaming looking at their procurement looking at their policies procedures they're interviewing I can see all the gaps I can see where they're going wrong especially where they're advertising you can't keep advertising in one paper and expect everybody to be reading that one paper. So it's like getting around the table and saying we need to engage with communities. But unless you have that ring fenced and it's positively then uh, proceeded towards that, um, you know, that's from, from our, for ourselves or an ethnic minority uh, communities, it, it's not going to target them. It's not going to target them. You're going to leave them out. So it has to be thought through, like my first mm. question before. It has to be thought through. You don't just do it as a reactive issue. And finally, Angela, would you like to add anything? Um, I think, I mean, what's left to, to add really from colleagues' excellent contributions? Um, the idea of, of mainstreaming, um, to my mind, should mean that budgeting, equalities in human rights budgeting should activate mainstreaming because it, that's, that's bringing a completion to, to the whole policy process where spending allocations and revenue decisions are entirely integral. So it, it is partly a question about following the money. So are resources being allocated in such a way that the policy intentions behind either policy or legislative intervention are going to be realised? And 
for committees in scrutiny rules, for policymakers in their roles of formulating and, and putting forward proposals, to ask as the starting point, will this policy, will this legal intervention advance equality and the realisation of rights? And if not, let's think again. And are we allocating our resources in such a way that we will realise those shared and common objectives? Um, and that means, as Judith has rightly said, there are many reasons for this and it's a very complex picture. But I think we have some very powerful levers in Scotland, the public sector equality duty, our commitment politically to human rights, um, the human rights legislation itself. But we see I think some weaknesses in the linking across, again, the very progressive ideas of the national performance framework, the discourse around social contract, and you know, inclusive growth as part of our, our um, economic strategy. We need to be a lot better at making those, those linkages across and using equality and human rights impact assessment in a much more rigorous and much more robust way than we currently do across public authorities, not just within government. You wanted to come in on that point. Yeah, um, just given the, the mention of the public sector equality duty, um, I think the Commission's sense is that, um, and this is not unique to the Scottish Government, it's across um, local government and other public bodies as well, is there are three parts to the public sector duty, the elimination of discrimination, the advancement of equality of opportunity, the fostering of good community relations. I think most public bodies get the first bit. Are we doing things, are we doing things that are bad? And let's assure ourselves that we are not doing things that are bad but then they tend to stop. And so particularly the issues which I think are germane to this discussion about how do we advance equality, how do we advance human rights, the, the, the analysis has stopped at that point. Um, and I think you can look at areas where, um, perhaps around apprenticeships or city deals, where policies appear to be neutral, where actually positive policy could have a very major impact on advancing equality of opportunity for groups who are being held back uh, over time but the analysis it hasn't been there, and then the monitoring, when it becomes apparent that they're not, doesn't kickstart any re revision of policy or approach. Thank you. I'd like to now open it up to my wider committee members. And uh, Mary, starting with you. Thank you, convener, and, and, and good morning, um, panel. M my question follows on nicely from um, the line of questioning that we've been looking at, and it's quite a straightforward question, but I suspect the answer will not be. And it is, how do we follow that money? Because often a figure will appear in a budget. How do we actually assess that the, the money that's put aside delivers the outcome that we're looking for? we're looking for, because it can be very difficult to follow a budget figure through, because government tends to be quite good at being very opaque about where the money goes. And, and the comment that you made, um, Angela, about you know asking the question about is it going to deliver, I suspect in, in, in any portfolio, if you question any government minister um, about are you delivering, you've, you've allocated X amount of money, are you delivering, the answer will be yes. So how do we actually follow the money to assess its, its delivering? I'll that one up first. If I, and the example that we would use is apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships in Scotland, where, again, we have a, um, a, well, well, a, a very successful programme, 25,000 young people in employment or in apprenticeship and training as a result of it. Uh, we have known for many years that there are issues of occupational segregation, which have largely not moved. Um, we published research from the Equality and Human Rights Commission in 2014, I think it was, which for the first time um, uncovered that less than 2% of apprenticeships were from ethnic minorities, which is at least half of what we would expect it to be on a level playing field, and that remarkably there were some 75 disabled people out of the 25,000 um, modern apprenticeships which were in place across Scotland. Now, to be fair, Skills Development Scotland have taken ownership of that and they have moved forward certainly on the disability issue but they appeared to be blind at that point they, they were not focusing on this so again I think it's the issue of scrutiny it's the issue of using data and monitoring clearly a policy which was intended to benefit all, all young people was significantly failing disabled people and young ethnic minority people um, nobody set out to exclude them but then equally nobody set out to include them so I think it's a really useful example of um, trying to analyse what went wrong, because nobody set out to exclude disabled people from this, but as I say, nobody equally set out to include them. And I think it's that element of 
advancing equality of inclusion, which is missing from a number of these programmes, and is, which I would therefore think is a, an area of significant scrutiny. So, see, see, on the issue of, of, of collection of, of, of data, mm. is there not enough in-depth collection done, or, or is there not enough focus put on what they should actually be collecting? I'm sure in this case that there was no analysis of data that was collected. Um, and that, to me, is, is extremely disturbing. Um, in other areas, yes, it is more difficult to collect data. It is sensitive personal data around religion, around sexual orientation. Yes, we accept that it is not always going to be complete. Uh, generally, data around disability, race, um, and certainly gender and age are quite usually quite complete. So um, where agencies aren't using the information which they themselves are generating and using that to inform future policy, we have a serious... That this is where we end up in these situations. Okay, that's helpful. Does anyone else want to? I think Angela would Angela. like to come in. If yeah. I can, thank you, convener. Um, how do we follow the money, Mary? Um, I think, in part, it's, it's you know, as Chris has outlined, it's there's there are questions around building the knowledge, building the competence of of our policymakers across the piece in challenge in again the starting point is this assumption of neutrality that that spending allocations are spending allocations are not actually about real people and not actually going to have an effect either that reinforces existing inequalities whether they are structural inequalities um, or the outcomes of of other people's actions um, and so that you know, we have to, to absolutely challenge that notion of, of neutrality, build the knowledge and competence in using the data that is there in analysis and applying that to um, policy development. And something that I think generically um, we're not very good at anywhere is, is evaluation and, and looking at implementation and how effective implementation has been. And it's with all of those considerations in mind, as well as the challenge of devising a new budget process, that the budget review group made the recommendations it did. And I think, um, and to clear an interest, obviously, as a member of the budget review group, so you know, forgive me for uh, you know, bumming up our recommendations, but um, I think there were some very positive recommendations in that report that has been accepted by the Parliament and the government um, in terms of opening up now to multiple sort of entry points for equalities analysis in the budget process. The emphasis on outcomes and the emphasis on pre-budget um, scrutiny so that we have a year-round process that looks at what are we spending, what are, we, what are the consequences and outcomes and results of that spending, and is that shift, you know, that phrase, is that shifting the needle? Are we seeing progression against where we want to be in terms of our equality outcomes? And if not, do we need to reorientate? So as well as those multiple entry points for that analysis in the revised budgetary process, there's also recommendations for the committees to, to be much more engaged across the piece, <laughs> but also to draw on a much wider range of information that includes the equality outcomes and mainstreaming reports of public authorities, which I think would help bring those, bring the, the public sector equality duty mechanisms into closer scrutiny and may improve performance in that regard as well. So that helps with the following the money. Thank you. Okay, um, I know Judith's got uh, a comment on this and I know Linda you have a supplementary but I'll just come to... Happy to take a supplementary. Oh Linda, do you want yeah. to come in here then? <clears throat> I'm trying to formulate it in my own head as, as I'm listening to everything you're all saying and, and I think what's striking me is you know, that it was mentioned at the beginning, uh, that difference between the theory and the implementation, and then um, the linking together all those um, who have an interest in it. And I think what I'm finding quite difficult is to understand and work out how you can have, from central government, very good policy. And we talk about monitoring it, we talk about gathering the, the data and analysing it. But if you've not got the very, very basic <clears throat> way of working at a public authority or local authority level, that becomes very difficult. And how do you join up that gap? Um, is it something as simple as ensuring proper staff training on a regular basis? as to how they do these things? Or is it 
much deeper analysis of the practice on the ground. And do you want to cover the area? Yeah, yeah, to to definitely. I mean, it's a similar. To be honest, it's not a different yeah. point. I, I suppose um, what what well, there's a number of things uh, under international human rights law. All public authorities, including government and public authorities across any state, have an obligation to deliver against the treaties that have been that the laws that have been signed up to. And in Scotland, we are signed up to all the treaties that the UK signed up to. So that would include the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. That's the suite of the international human rights framework. Now, it, I, ideally. <laughs> and in fact, obligated, they are obligated to all our public authorities in Scotland should be able to articulate, understand and deliver against those international standards. Now, the, the treaties are a high level, body, high level kind of instruments, but underneath those instruments are very clear and considered and thought through processes and, and uh, standards and norms which actually support states uh, and all the different actors within states to to really to be able to look are we delivering against these these international treaties now they're not, they are actually non-political because they're, 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 they're they've been signed up to as 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 as, as state actors um, and they have the they have a what they for me apart from delivering on the obligations and being built on a framework of recognising that some they're intrinsic to society, some people will do worse and some people will do better. And that's part of the, and that the people who are going to do worse are vulnerable and need additional inputs and supports and that we know as society who those people are. We know early doors and we know up front and we have an obligation as a state to ensure that those people's lives are, are improved. That's true of all states. Clearly that happens to greater or lesser extent in different states. We know that. Um, so having that common language, that common understanding, having it, in, well, having it enshrined in, peop in the analysis and the way public authorities and government are looking at policy development, having that upfront, understanding that if we do it well for the people who are most vulnerable, everybody else will benefit. That's the rationale on which those international standards are established. And so, so... Uh, we're a long way from that. Uh, so what I'm saying is it feels quite idealistic. It feels almost like, why are you saying that? <laughs> because we're so far away from that. But the standards are very clear. They, they actually do provide a framework. For example, we talk endlessly as a commission, to be honest, in my view, and we have to, about what we call the panel principles, participation, um, accountability, non-discrimination, empowerment, legality. Uh, they're actually fundamental principles of international human rights law. They're cross-cutting of all the treaties. Um, if we incorporated our thinking and our analysis, our perspective in the, in the generation of policy, the, 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 the comment that Chris was, the, the example Chris used there about the modern apprenticeships would have been completely different. The, the policy would have, we would still have had modern apprenticeships. It's a very good and supportive idea in terms of supporting those um, uh, who need that support. But the whole basis on which the policy would have been developed would have been developed with that analysis in train and it would actually have monitored the data. It would have had an accountability process built into it. It would have understood that in order to actually target people who are currently being discriminated against, we need to do X, Y and Z because we would have asked those people. We would have known up front what it was that they were that their needs were and what was the best route to actually get to them. Safia has outlined, Safia will know exactly what it's going to take to get into those communities, to get people who are not accessing those markets into those processes. Why is that not happening? That for me is not neither rocket science, <laughs> but, but, but isn't built into our processes in a systematic way. We, I, have, I have seen myriad, many actual, very good and well-intentioned policies, laws, uh, etc., coming from the Scottish Government and Parliament. And I do think things are improving. It's not that we are on a, uh, uh, an improving trend. We're also being deeply undermined by some policies and practices which are coming from the UK government. I'm absolutely clear on that. And so the support, so that that then places an additional responsibility on the Scottish government to respond to the needs of its population, actually. And so, so we're in, 
it's a bit of a moving feast, but in terms of <laughs> human rights budgeting, because the budgeting is an end of a process, it's not the beginning of a process. It's, it, it, in fact, it's cyclical. And so, so um, I suppose I feel if, if we had that common language, if we integrated human rights standards and norms and analysis and understanding and processes into our delivery through our public authority processes, we would be having a different kind of conversation at the moment. We, we would, that language would be much better understood, much better. Um, uh, when we said something, it would be understood right down the line, as opposed to being something which, which um, we've all, we're all coming at it with our different priorities and our different places and our, our, our different processes. Now, the equalities framework gives us a huge amount actually in that. Um, uh, it, it, it goes a long way to, to, to but what it doesn't do, it, there are bits missing within the equality framework that don't actually effectively deliver some of the human rights standards. So I'm not, I, and we can have that conversation if you want. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're not nowhere. I, I don't want to say that, but we have a long way to go. All right, thanks, Judith. That's uh, quite a comprehensive Sorry. <laughs> diet of information. I know you sparked something here because I, we've got Chris and Angela and Mary wants to come in on a supplementary. So, good. and so, who else? And Safia. And Safia. So, <laughs> so Chris. I think just okay. to add on um, uh, Judith's analysis, if you think about something like the Convention of the Rights of Disabled People and the commitment in that that the UK has signed up to in terms of independent living, what we would expect to see is that would have a full expression in terms of self-directed support. We would expect to see it reflected in housing policy. We would expect to see it reflected in transport and our digital infrastructure, areas where we know that there are significant barriers for disabled people's full participation in society. We have a government framework around disabled people's rights and independent living, but it is entirely predicated on local authority, health and other agencies' delivery who are rightly independent of government, but there is no checking. So, as I, I come back to the point I made at the start, the 50,000 affordable houses that we are seeking to build in Scotland could make a really significant impact on people's right to live at home in dignified situations, but it will only happen if we purposefully approach it. And I think what's missing from government at the moment is setting a sense of setting the pace, whether it's about apprenticeships, how many disabled people would we expect to be in apprenticeships, rather than just saying, we'll just leave it to chance. How many houses that we are going to build will be fully accessible? How many buses that when we look at um, you know, franchising or approving tenders, what's the commitment in that to fully accessible transport? Unless we build these things up, I mean, we, it's lovely to have the statement, mm but it's dependent on other actors. And that's the problem where I think we see a lot of what we aspire to falling down. Okay, Angela and then Safia. Um, I suppose to come back to Linda's question about, you know, is it about deeper analysis and, and practice on the ground or is it about training? It's about all of those things. And I think you know, it's about building the competence that can result in the purposeful approach that Chris has talked about. And as colleagues have said quite rightly, there are many positive levers and we have a, a positive disposition um, in Scotland from this government and this parliament um, towards you know, advancing equalities and human rights, but it's making the, the crossover, making those linkages much stronger. And so while there is very good policy that can come out, we also see a, an inconsistency there. And, and two, two quick examples. The Scottish National Investment Bank. Great, very interesting idea. Um, the consultation has no reference to equalities and human rights, whereas we should be talking about our investment in the well-being of our country and taking a, a much more expansive view of investment than being about bridges and roads and things we can point at and count, but actually talking about, and, and certainly the expansion of childcare that we've seen in the last few years, enormously welcome as it is, and has started from a different um, discursive place, a different conceptual place about expanding, seeing childcare, investment in the physical facility, in the childcare, you know, in the estate, um, as being about 
capital investment, but that bigger investment in early years, that bigger investment in labour market participation and that investment in our tax base. So we've seen an argument in the round there. We've not always managed to hold it in that space. Um, but we've not seen that read across at the start of a conversation about the National Investment Bank. Um, so Scottish Women's Budget Group and Gender um, close the gap and others have come up with some principles um, that the committee will no doubt see when it looks at the consultation responses um, on the, the National Investment Bank. Um, but it's about making the... Seeing the frameworks and the, the concepts that we're talking about as enabling rather than compliance mechanisms, and I think that's a big part of the issue in terms of public authorities' implementation of all of um, these proposals. I'm seeing it at the moment in the evaluation I'm doing on participatory budgeting, where the public sector equality duty in all its components is not seen as an enabling platform for participatory budgeting. Um, and there, there are many, um, I think, examples. Um, we've got a new debate positively initiated debate on ta tax and the role of tax mm -hmm. but again it, there's a you know a very good very well informed um, discussion paper from the Scottish Government but is framed around a set of assumptions and one needs to question the extent to which assumptions are in within that are considered to be neutral rather than actually looking at all the intersecting implications of, of those assumptions I could go on but I won't I'll just leave you with uh, <laughs> city deals you know <laughs> Don't even start. <laughs> and Safia. I wanted to give some examples. That, um, uh, I like the question of how do we follow the money. Well, I mean, the money's there, and when the money's given, that's the problem of a lot of public bodies and a lot of you know grants and things. And it's the consistency of the data. There isn't enough data, so that was the question. There isn't. It's not accurate. When we ask for data, we ask for them to come back to us. They won't have the statistics. It won't be broken down. What isn't broken down into ethnic minorities? If it's broken down into ethnic minorities, they're all uh, protected characteristics are all lumped into one, which isn't really very helpful if we're trying to break it down even more and see how diverse if their workforce is. One of the uh, things that we had is when we did partnership with Keep Scotland Beautiful. I don't know if you've heard of KSB. And, um, and they had to meet race equality targets. Now, the CCF tender ensured that um, KSB sought a partnership with Semvo Scotland because they wanted to make sure that they had the increased ethnic minority access to CCF. And uh, the, uh, the thing was, is because they had to make sure and they were told in many ways to do that and to assure that, that's why they really came to us. And that's, that's one of the things is, if we want the money there and we need the money to be actually used to look at a diverse workforce, to look at a diverse communities, is that maybe when we do the tender processes is maybe putting the implications in there in the beginning. So making sure that then they have to come round the table and they have to come to certain organisations and groups and make them accessible. Because the problem we're having is we're not actually enforcing that. We've got, the you know, just like, uh, you know, Judith and everybody on the panel have emphasised, we've got the legislation, but it's not been implemented down bottom. It's at the top and it's nicely, it's filtered down certain levels, managers. I do training. Training is really important. You have a workforce that doesn't understand its, um, you know, its, its, its communities. It doesn't understand. And we've got this huge implementation of the financial inclusion programmes now that was going to come because, you know, Scotland's going to get the social security, some of it some social security benefits uh, from uh, Westminster. Ethnic minority communities, a lot of them don't understand how this is going to Im impact on them. So we have a financial uh, inclusion programme that Semvo Scotland delivers, specifically targeting and helping um, you know, small communities and also through other organisations. So, you know, so we're helping already through established organisations and helping them understand the whole system and helping them understand their communities. Mary, do you still want to come in with your Yes, yes I do. It's just a, a, a very brief question. Because quite, quite often governments will say by year, whenever, 10, 15, 20 years from hence, we will have achieved X and we will spend X in the budget. Is there enough of a connect between the rhetoric of in 20 years we'll have and what's in the budget on an annual basis? Do the two constantly match up and are, are they constantly assessed or should there be more um, analysis done into, we've said this, but is this amount of money going to achieve that? Anyone want to come in on that? Angela? Just very briefly to, to refer back to the proposals in the budget review group 
um, really for the revised budget process that, that is pushing the, the scrutiny process to being year round and within a multi uh, a multi annual financial framework as well. So some to, all of which to address some of the questions that you've raised there, Mary, about being able to and being able to, to look across the spending period to see what changes have been delivered, to look at it on, on that longitudinal basis, but also um, on an incremental basis, you know, year on year. Is it achieving? Because, of course, I mean, one of the things that happens in a political process is the political parties want to um, you know, expose and engage um, with one another in, in um, a very political way. But policy change and implementation takes time. And sometimes that implementation is a bit out of sync with the politics of the situation. So by having longer scrutiny and longer periods of scrutiny, but also more continuous sort of monitoring, you can see the extent to which the changes that are desired are happening or not, but over a reasonable time frame. And Judith, you want to come in there? Just in, and in relation to how that would be seen to be and be delivering in international human rights terms, um, that commitment to both understanding whether we are achieving progressive realisation, so are we making progress, is something that does need to be constantly monitored. That's one of the standards of the, um, economic, uh, the Treaty on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, but also no regression. So are we, are we, are we going back? It's not, ju it's not just to measure progress, it's to measure that we're not actually going back. We have a state obligation to no, for no regression. And so if, we're, if, we're, if we are going back on, on, on key areas, um, then that, that would need remedial action and, and immediate remedial action in order, to, in order to, to, to change that. Now, that's a key issue in terms of money being extracted from public sector delivery on the ground in communities. Um, but for local authorities, I would, I, we haven't, we're not in a position to do that kind of detailed budget analysis, but I, I would imagine at the moment in Scotland, local authorities are experiencing a, a context where they are regressing um, in terms of their delivery in relation to international human rights standards. Um, and that is, the, 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 that language, the language of accountability in relation to those standards is not, is not used. We're not, we're, not, we're not thinking in that way and seeing our, the outcome of our activities and our decisions in that kind of way. And that means that when we actually do the analysis down the line, we're not saying, well, what are the impact on, on the communities that we know will experience more acutely um, the, the impact of those spending decisions? So th th this is a whole system picture. It's not, it's, it, it, and the budgetary process is a really important part of that. And I'm, I'm glad Angela brought up the issue of taxation because again, we're not we're not in isolation from the means by which we raise revenue, and um, this is the, the the if we're not if there is regression, um, we need to factor in that the revenue raising capacity that we have as a, a, a um, Scottish government and parliament, but also hold to account the UK government and parliament in relation to those issues, and we have a duty to ensure that um, we're making progress. We can put terms on what that progress is. We can say we can do it in this time frame. We can, but in order to say that, we need to be able to measure and check and know that that is what we're actually doing. So, I mean, we would support, uh, I would say, all the recommendations of the Budget Review Group in terms of better contributing to what ultimately down the line would deliver a human rights-based analysis. It, it doesn't, it, they don't go the whole way because their human rights are not explicitly in it, but it, it goes a long way to help, help government and parliament do that. On that point, um, specifically about the idea that local authorities may be regressing because of their very constrained budgetary realities and, and the rest of it, is part of that in that Scotland is signed up, as you rightly said, to a number of human, tri uh, treaty, uh, human rights treaties which make up that broader rights framework. Um, but in a lot of cases, we've not incorporated those obligations into law. As such, there is no access to justice and therefore no penalty to local authorities who allow rights to be impinged or denied or don't take sufficient steps to ensure that they're there. Is that the X factor? Is, is incorporation of, for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which would give access to justice to children, um, the X factor which will make local authorities take this seriously and realise that if they don't take it seriously, they could end up in court? It's certainly the backstop of protection, absolutely. So if we, if we did in, incorporate um, our uh, 
economic, social, cultural rights, or did it through the, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, or many of the other treaties, CEDAW, um, uh, the CRPD, um, we, would, we would put ourselves in a position where legally we were bound, and this is the impact of incorporation from my perspective, isn't just about the backstop of protection in the courts, it's what it would do, it's what it would do in the policy generating process. So we are already, as a commission, brought into conversations where um, the, our duties around the Human Rights Act, because it's an, it incorporates civil and political rights, well, we have to comply with that. Yes, you do. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll help you understand what the analysis is to comply with that. Although, to be honest, it would be much better if you could do that yourselves. I, I don't, I'm not talking just in this room. I'm talking in many other rooms. Um, th that's a very good thing. So it means that people are having to think, oh, right, OK, I've got the Human Rights Act at my back. I don't want to be subject to some kind of judicial review or legal process at the end of the day. So up front, they make the policy that delivers against the, the, the obligations of the Human Rights Act. Exactly the same if we were to incorporate economic and social cultural rights. In, it, we would then be required to have those things. Are we meeting the standards and norms of the, the treaties? Are we, is our provision accessible, available, adequate, and of a good enough quality to ensure people's rights are being met? So if we're not, then we have to kind of think up the line that that... that, that um, that that, that that would be the case. And so for me, the justiciability or the incorporation of the, 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 the treaties, it, it does something not just about having a court action at the end of the day. It does it because it makes people think about it upstream. And that's, that's actually the most important implication. We don't want to get to court. We want it to be better <laughs> up front. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Linda, can I just check? Did you ask the question that you had in mind? Because you're still on my list. About race? No, no, um, oh, not yet. Okay. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I know Jamie, you wanted to come in. Oh yes, please. Thank you. Well, we don't have a lot of time, so okay. if we can just keep answers succinct. Thanks, Camino, and, and good morning, panel. Um, could I just pick up on something um, in the wise submission uh, to us? Uh, it's just that really uh, to clarify the terminology used. Uh, you say that wise research reaffirms arguments on the importance of developing tax policy based on gender analysis that highlights differentials in ability to pay and different economic status of women, um, and therefore we consider progressive taxation as a result of that analysis. What does that mean? <laughs> um, it means that tax design, how, what kind of tax system we set up affects women and men differently, because women and men have different sources of income, have different lived experiences, there are different sources of income um, and the inequalities within this, those different sources of income have um, an impact on the ability to pay so, and the extent to which tax is a proportion of, of, of income. Um, the formulation of words, I think, is, is um, a consequence of having to be, be very succinct in, in evidence. But basically, it's, it's again about removing the, this assumption of neutrality in tax systems, that tax systems um, do have a, a, gen, a very highly gendered dimension. And so um, when we look at, I think, the very, as I've said earlier, the very um, positive paper that's come out from the Scottish Government in the last couple of weeks on the role of tax in the budget process and the options that are set out therein and their um, beginnings of, of exploring those impacts the paper very usefully highlights different occupations to give a, an idea to help people orientate and see themselves in there. But behind all those different um, job clusters, you know, childminder or police officer or solicitor um, or the other examples that are given, I see big occupationally gendered <laughs> um, groups of workers. And I'm reminded as well that there are 300,000 fewer um, women taxpayers in Scotland. So we also need to look across that what is the impact of taxation on incomes and those different income sources. And then we look at the budget and we see that 1% of the current budget expenditure is on employment, skills and fair work. So we've got a big issue there in terms of using public money to foment and advance um, attachment to participation in the labour market that allows people to, to pay tax. Um, but we also are looking at what's coming down the line from the UK government, and Judith's already alluded to the, the damaging consequences of, of UK government actions and um, colleagues at the UK Women's Budget Group 
um, and the Runnymede Trust just yesterday um, produced some you know, horrendous uh, you know, data that, that shows the horrendous impact um, of um, cumulative cuts to, and changes in, in benefits to, to women, particularly particularly black women, you know, £5,000 um, a year um, income loss to those women. So we need to look at those intersections of the characteristics of women and men, but those intersections in terms of sources of income um, and how tax design will affect um, people's incomes. Yeah. Okay, maybe I could be more specific. Is your statement there advocating differential tax rates for men and women or for different groups of employment? No, the statement is about ensuring that there is effective, robust gendered analysis of whatever tax design proposals are put forward. Okay, thanks. You wanted to come in? Yeah, could I just give a practical and positive example of how this might play out as both Angela and I are members of eBag, uh, wonderfully named eBag, um, the Quality Budget Advisory Group. They looked at the introduction of stamp duty which in effect, you know, you think, well, is that, that's neutral. And they looked at it through a range of different lenses from age, gender, race. Uh, to be fair, there wasn't a huge amount of data, but we're looking at how often you will bump up against stamp duty by who's most active in the housing market. Now, clearly, it confirmed that younger people were going to do that. So knowing, being conscious of the impact of your decisions enables you to take mitigatory action or enables you to to um, you know, say, well, that's acceptable, or it's not acceptable. So in a very simple way, that starts to, to uncover the, the consequences of the path that we choose to take. Mm. And I think that is being con for a government to be conscious of what it's doing, rather than unconscious around the, the ripple effect of policy. Very OK. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we'll have to stop it there, but um, uh, your answer has been excellent, very thorough. Um, as ever, if there are things that you would have liked to have said, and I know there were questions that I didn't have time to invite colleagues to ask, but uh, if there's additional information, please do supply that to us in writing, um, and we'll keep this dialogue open. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, move to private session, uh, so thank you very much indeed.